Okay, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to those joining us from around the world. And welcome to Crest's fifth annual World Tourism Day Forum. My name is Samantha Bray, and I'm the Managing Director of Crest and the Vice Chair of the Future of Tourism Coalition. I am honored to be this year's Forum Master of Ceremonies. And this year's topic is Tourism in a Climate Crisis, Taking Practical Action. And we'd like to start by thanking our partner, Tourism Declares a Climate Emergency. This event is possible due to the incredible work your team is doing to lead our beloved industry into a better future. We would also like to thank the sponsors of the World Tourism Day Forum, World Wildlife Fund, Holbrook Travel, and Legacy Vacation Resorts, in addition to today's speakers who will be introduced to you throughout the program. Our sponsors and speakers leadership and climate action and belief in our endeavor to provide practical guidance to the tourism industry on this critical topic enables us to bring our vision of transforming the way the world travels to life. So our participants, we hope the program we have put together informs, empowers, and inspires each of you to take practical action in tangible and realistic ways. Thank you sincerely for being here. We know there are infinite ways you can choose to spend your time in this virtual world, and we are honored to have you with us. To enable you to make the most of your time with us, we will be sharing follow-up resources, including answers to frequently asked questions soon after the event. Now, before we dig in, I'd like to share a few housekeeping instructions. With the exception of speakers, please keep your cameras off to help us minimize the carbon footprint of this event and to maximize bandwidth. During the inspiration panel, please pose questions using the Q&A function and use the chat for discussion. While we won't be able to get to every question, we will be compiling the FAQs uh, following the event as well. And during the inspiration panel, we'll be answering as many questions as we can live. Please keep your microphones muted to eliminate any background noise for other participants. And if you get disconnected, please use the same Zoom link to rejoin. We will also be live streaming today's events on Facebook Live, and we encourage you to visit the Center for Responsible Travel's Facebook page and share it with your networks. And now, without further ado, I'm pleased to, to virtually introduce you to Dr. Gregory Miller, Crest Executive Director. Greg is a global tourism and conservation leader committed to people, planet, and prosperity, joining Crest as Executive Director in 2019. Prior to joining Crest, Greg spent a total of 25 plus years as VP at the Nature Conservancy, President of the American Hiking Society, and as an Environmental Advisor for USAID. Greg, the floor is yours. Great, thank you, uh, Samantha. I really appreciate it. And greetings to everyone across the planet and a very happy, somewhat belated World Tourism Day to everyone. On behalf of Crest, our board and staff, a hearty thanks again to our sponsors were Wildlife Fund, Holbrook Travel, and Legacy Vacation Resorts for their support and leadership. And again, I want to just echo Samantha's good words and recognize our collaboration with Tourism Declares a Climate Emergency and really our stellar lineup of thought leaders and practitioners, and of course, all our participants today and tomorrow. And I would be remiss as executive director of Crest not to send out a special note of gratitude to Team Crest. Samantha, Alex Collins, Kelsey Frankiel, and Ellen Rue, plus our Crest board members who will be joining us today and tomorrow have made this possible. We are no question confronted with a formidable dilemma of past, present, and future challenges. In addition to the terrible ongoing impacts of the pandemic, no one has escaped the hazards brought on by the climate crisis. Extreme heat, wildfires, drought, coastal and inland flooding, and of course, increased frequency and intensity of storms. As the climate crisis serves up a up change at a rapid clip and destabilizes destinations worldwide, how does the tourism sector, defined by the movement of people and hampered by the pandemic, also carbonize? Since we cannot predict what the climate is going to do, immediate efforts are needed to address climate change adaptation, resilience, and mitigation. And our thought leaders will be uh, addressing this over the next couple of days. Therefore, it is much less about meeting the next challenge when it arrives, shoulders squared with our laptops in hand, but rather it's about being prepared beforehand to meet any challenge and by having the right mindset to take action. 
Climate change adaptation, as we all know, is where we understand local climate change risks and develop plans to manage them by altering our behavior, systems, and yes, way of life to protect our families, economies, and the environment. Where our climate change mitigation means acting now to avoid or reduce greenhouse gas emissions through business practices and natural climate solutions to reduce global warming. Our intention today is to recognize and be open to change now so that destinations, accommodations, and tour operators can define and address tourism emissions and respond to continued climate change uncertainty. At Crest, we encourage everyone across the tourist sector to develop this mindset, to master and practice thoughtful, deliberate climate action planning and show that such a mindset can also act as a kind of force multiplier in your business and across the sector, in part by showing why taking action now is beneficial to your bottom line, local community, and collective future. Over the next two days, we will take this journey together with a clear sense of purpose and hope that there are positive, tangible steps that we must take to mitigate, adapt, and become more resilient to the undeniable current and future impacts of climate change. So it's my great pleasure to get us started. And I want to introduce now Elizabeth Watuti, a passionate environmentalist and climate activist from Kenya, as our keynote. She is founder of the Green Generation Initiative, a full member of the Green Belt Movement, and board member of the Elephant Neighbors Center. Elizabeth has sent us a video because today she is in Milan at the pre-UN Climate Change Conference, which brings together climate and energy ministers from a selected group of countries to discuss and exchange views on some key political aspects of the COP26 negotiations. Elizabeth has been honored with the Diana Award, was a regional finalist for Africa for the United Nations Young Champions of the Earth. In 2020, she was also a Commonwealth Youth Awards finalist for Africa and Europe. And at COP25 in Madrid, she received the Young Climate Champion Award from the Green Climate Fund. Elizabeth has showcased her climate solutions at several high level international conferences and we are thrilled that she has accepted our invitation to speak to us. Elizabeth Watuti. Samantha. Hi everyone. Thank you so much for this wonderful opportunity to give this keynote address in this event. My name is Elizabeth Watuti. I'm an environmentalist and a climate activist from Kenya the founder of Green Generation Initiative that nurtures young people to love nature and to be environmentally conscious, and also the head of campaigns at Wangare Mathai Foundation. And I also coordinate DAIMA, which is a coalition of civic actors who have come together to advocate for the protection of urban green spaces. Today is very important because it reminds us all that now more than ever, we must embrace responsible and sustainable tourism for environmental protection and development. Take a moment to recognize how far we've come on climate. We have started this decisive decade with more technological solutions, political and private sector commitments to decarbonize, and even more public support for climate action than ever before. People really understand what is going on, but what we need to begin seeing is turning those reactions into action. And we need to begin seeing more urgent action from our world leaders, from corporations, from businesses, people who have got the power and the resources to do much more for the planet. All the net zero targets that have proliferated in recent months represent a new threshold, a definite structure of change in the global economy, our climate turning point. This has been achieved and thanks to the hard work from so many all around the world. We have come a long way, but there's still so much more that needs to be done. There is still so much carbon dioxide in our atmosphere and too much heat in the oceans following over a century of unabated emissions increases. 
it's making us and our climate sick. We urgently need to relocate that carbon back into our plants and soil where it belongs by protecting and restoring nature. Rising impacts of the climate crisis requires us all to begin doing things differently. And we can really tell from the impact of this crisis that it, it is affecting the people who have the least capacity to adapt and the people who have the least amount of resources to be able to adapt to this crisis. The challenges and impacts of the climate crisis from the droughts, the floods, landslides, mudslides, desert locust invasions, water crisis, all of these things are affecting people who have even least contributed to this problem. And the more we continue to delay action, the more we continue to cause more loss and damage. This is a life and death matter, and we have to begin acting urgently. The tourism sector, for instance, must confront the climate crisis, as well as acknowledge its own role in providing and acting on solutions urgently. The tourism sector is highly vulnerable to climate change and at the same time contributes to the emission of greenhouse gases. So accelerating climate action in tourism is therefore of utmost importance for the resilience of the sector. Since we started burning fossil fuels in the 1950s, terrestrial ecosystems have been helping us a lot. They have been absorbing on average per year roughly 25% of our greenhouse gas emissions, that is in trees, biomass, and soils. The more fossil fuels we burn, the more stress we put on the planet, and the more planet Earth has been helping us by absorbing more and more of our emission. This is proof of the biophysical resilience of the Earth. It's been protecting us. What have we been doing to the natural world as the human race? We have been at war with nature for a very long time now. I remember as a child growing up in the most forested region, I got an opportunity to spend time close to the wild forest, to spend time close to clean streams. And all of these things made me connect to nature and love nature at a young age. And that is why up to date, I would want to visit a green space, a park, a forest that's next to me to find peace and to just be at par with nature. But what has been happening has been so challenging because I remember even as a child, I faced ecological grief. The wild forest that I like to play in and the clean streams were totally destroyed. And that natural world that my friends and I knew as children changed completely before our eyes. And this is the same trend that is happening to the world today. Humanity is at war with nature. When we first planted trees as children, we thought that those trees were going to grow up to maturity. Until a time when I went to check on how the trees were doing and found tree logs and tree stumps years later. And I did not understand why nobody valued that particular ecosystem, that particular forest that I really held dearly to my heart. That's the same case that is happening. During the last 150 years, we have also cut down forests and destroyed terrestrial ecosystems and transformed them into agriculture, infrastructure, and cities. Roughly 50% of the land area on planet Earth has been transformed from its natural state, particularly into agriculture. And as a result, we have already warmed the planet at unprecedented speed. We've lost 60% of the populations of wild mammals since 1970. Our rich and diverse insect and plant life is also in rapid decline. We are losing the biodiversity of life that creates the conditions for life. And also what really makes the tourism sector thrive. So if the tourism sector has to survive, nature has to thrive. And we must make sure that we are doing everything possible to make nature thrive and survive. Right now, no other industry has been as well positioned as tourism in its nursing and suffering the far-reaching impacts of climate change. And this damage, as you can tell, is almost irreversible when it comes to our natural resources. And also the tourism sector has witnessed challenges facing communities, the cultural sites, wildlife and protected areas, all the elements that have been drawing travelers and tourists. 
And yet, since pre-pandemic, the global tourism industry has dragged its feet in confronting the climate crisis or even acknowledging its role in it. Greenhouse emissions from tourism remain largely unmeasured and reported at a destination level, nor are there global reporting standards for it. These are things that need to change if we are to do anything when it comes to addressing and tackling the climate crisis. These are issues that we cannot continue to ignore. In order to secure a safe operating space for humanity, it's not going to be enough to phase out fossil fuels in one generation. We also need to keep all our remaining natural ecosystems intact and then massively increase investments in nature regeneration. We need to become very, very careful caretakers of the oceans and all the natural ecosystems on land, our global commons. We know instinctively that damaging our ecosystems is wrong. Major diversity loss and ecosystem collapse and failure to halt global warming are now ranked by leaders in business, government, and civil society as two of the top five threats humanity will face in the next 10 years. Also, natural disasters caused by human ecosystem disruption and climate change already cost us more than $300 billion per year. But you know what? We can change costs, and many people are already doing just that. When I founded Green Generation Initiative in 2016, my focus was to make sure that I get children to love nature and to be environmentally conscious at a young age. And I started through a campaign that I dubbed Adopt a Tree Campaign to make sure that I'm inculcating a tree growing culture among the children. So the focus was to make sure that every child in every school in my country would get a chance to plant and adopt a tree each in their school compound. And we focused also a lot on climate change <laughs> adaptation, where the trees that we are planting in schools are actually fruit trees. So we get to the significant corners in the school compound and establish food forests. And by food forest, we plant mixed species of fruit trees. And at the end of the day, this means that the trees, once they're grown, are not only going to provide that beautiful environment that is attractive, but will also provide something nutritious for the children to feed at the end of the day. And this means that we are also addressing food insecurity and also greening and beautifying schools. We want to give the schools a face that the children can directly connect to. So you can join in too. Nature is highly resilient. It has been helping us for so long and now it is time for us to help nature. The fact that we have not yet done what we need to do to reach the turning point for nature when we foster a fundamental shift away from our current devastating paradigm of nature loss towards creating a nature positive world by the end of this decade is alarming. And it also makes this an extraordinary exciting time to be alive because there is just so much we can and must contribute there. Investing in nature-based solutions is how we will do the necessary work of absorbing the emissions already loaded in our atmosphere and relocate them back to where they belong in the soil and plants. And these solutions awaken our imagination in ways that emission reductions are not able to. This is about the food we eat, the forest we walk in, the bad songs we enjoy, the parks, forests, and beautiful places we visit. And every bare part of land can be regenerated quickly and every government, every company, every corporation, and every family can participate. This is where I would dream that your hearts and minds, capital and expertise will now channel a great injection of energy. That yes, we must reduce our emissions, that goes without saying. But in addition to that, we have to massively regenerate nature and we have to really fight to make sure that all our remaining natural ecosystems stay intact. Protecting and restoring our natural ecosystems is half the fight for life, for a livable future for humanity. And doing it feels really good too. Nature is not just an optional extra or an enactment. It is part of our essence, the natural home of our sites. Protecting and restoring nature, as I know from my own lived experience, can awaken the deep bond. It can remind us of who we are. So how inspiring it is to imagine participating in a great regeneration. I'd like to complete by leaving you with a quote from the late Professor Ngai Masai, who was the first African woman to win the Nobel Peace Prize. 
she always insisted on the fact that those of us who understand who feel must not tire, we must not give up. The burden is on us who know and those who don't know are at peace. It is us who know that get disturbed and are caused to take action. We the young people have been speaking up for decades and demanding for urgent climate action. And this is the time for the world to now turn their words into action because pledges, commitments and promises are not enough if they do not in any way reflect what is changing right now. We need to act with urgency and begin to treat the climate crisis as a crisis because the people that are the most affected will continue to suffer if we do not take action, and that is not what we want. We must begin to act urgently and treat the climate crisis as a crisis. And then remember that we have to be mindful of how we leave this planet for the next generations. How do you want to respond to your child or grandchild when they ask you what you did to save this planet? I hope everyone can choose to be counted as the generation that did everything in their power to stop or tackle the climate and ecological crisis. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Elizabeth, for that eye-opening and inspiring message. If anyone would like to get in touch with Elizabeth, the email address for the Green Generation Initiative has been shared in the chat. As Elizabeth stated, nature is more than just an optional extra or an enactment. It is part of our essence. And that is certainly true for the tourism industry. We can all participate and inject our hearts and energy into solving the climate crisis. But how do we do that? And that's what we're going to cover next. The Glasgow Declaration, which we will be discuss discussing shortly, will help the tourism industry on this path forward. And to in introduce the Pathways to Action, I now have the pleasure of introducing you to Jeremy Smith, co-founder of Tourism Declares a Climate Emergency. Tourism Declares is a global tourism initiative of over 300 tourism destinations, businesses, and organizations committed to science-based climate action. In addition to many other admirable past and ongoing endeavors to advance responsible and regenerative tourism, Jeremy also co-founded Trevindi, the first travel industry news site focused on the ideas, innovations, and issues shaping a sustainable future for tourism. Most recently, he's a partner in drafting the Glasgow Declaration to be officially launched at COP26, which aims to act as a catalyst for increased urgency about the need to accelerate climate action and tourism and to secure strong actions and commitments to cut tourism emissions in the in at least half over the next decade to reach net zero emissions as soon as possible before 2050. You'll also find Jeremy leading the charge to create climate action blueprints for destinations, tour operators, and accommodations, which are planned for release at COP26 and have provided the foundation of tomorrow's technical track workshops. I'm going to change the rules just for this plenary. If you have questions for Jeremy during his presentation, please drop them in the chat and Jeremy will answer them as he can following the presentation. Again, we will compile the frequently asked questions at the end of today's session and share an FAQs document with you. Jeremy, thank you for being here. The virtual floor is yours. Thank you so very much indeed. Um, let me just share my screen and start most of all with an enormous thank you to Crest. And just to say thank you so much. This is the first time in Tourism Declares is year and a half, 20 months of life that we have, um, hang on, that's not fully screened, is it? You want full screen, there you go. Um, <clears throat> yeah, this is the first time that we have been asked to co-host an event, so it is an enormous privilege. But most of all, thank you to the people, thank you to Samantha, to Alex, to Kelsey, in particular, the three of you for putting up with me, for putting this whole thing together, for guiding us to here, to actually make this whole thing possible, and for, you know, getting us from where we started with an idea that it would be a good idea to an inc truly incredible two days of event that you've managed to put together. So thank you and humble congratulations as well. <clears throat> but before we get to today and to the Glasgow Declaration, let's take a step back because if I'm going to set the scene for climate action, I'd like to maybe tell a bit of a story about how we, Tourism Declares, got to where we are. 
So if we can remember way back before that thing dominated the conversations that we had every day, back into 2018, these were the conversations of tourism. It was a conversation of over tourism. We were protesting on the streets of Venice, protesting against two large cruise ships dominating the canals. In Amsterdam, they were removing the iconic I Amsterdam logo from in front of the Rijksmuseum because just too many people were coming to take their photo with it. They moved it somewhere else. And although climate wasn't really something that was being addressed in a coordinated way, that onward growth and increased energy around tourism, the increased amount of activity, meant that as we did look at it, that the report came out, it was by nature and climate change, and what it said is that when we really factor in all that our industry does, tourism is four times worse for the climate than we thought. And those numbers continue to shift and continue to shift upwards, not downwards, if you step aside from the time right now, of course, when we are not really going very many places. But when two of the lead science, climate scientists in tourism looked at our system, our industry, what they said is that it's increasingly at odds with objectives to reduce global resource use. And that business as usual tourism back in 2018, if we continued on that path, and if that was the path that we returned to when we get back to traveling again, we're going to double energy use in 25 years, double land use in the same time, and double water use in 45 years. And these, of course, are the time scales that we're supposed to be reaching zero, not doubling. And it comes because we have plans for 36,000 new planes to be built in 20 years, 136 new airports so scheduled to be built in China alone. And back in 2018, this was also the first time that this amer amazing young climate activist, just like Elizabeth Rattuti, came onto the scene and began to grip us into the consciousness. And here she is at the launch of Extinction Rebellion in October 2018. And as Greta Thunberg said, everything needs to change. And it has to start today. And then it was 2019. And the floods in Venice were some of the worst that the city had ever seen. And climate change was what came to Venice, not cruise ships. And at the Rijks Museum, they weren't removing the I Amsterdam logos. They were trying to remove the protesters because there was Extinction Rebellion now in front of the Rijks Museum. And already at that time, they were beginning, those Extinction Rebellion protesters, the Fridays for Future, were beginning to focus on tourism and our impacts and our responsibilities. Here they are stringing themselves beneath the boat, beneath the bridges in Amsterdam to stop the canal boats coming along and to talk directly to tourists about the impact of their holidays. And this guy got on top of a plane at Stansted, a former Paralympian, visually impaired guy, climbed out of a plane that he had booked a seat onto and got onto it to stop the thing. Only last week he was sent to prison for the protest that he made. And then it was also the time that for me, this became a very personal thing. I've been writing and working on climate change for a very long time and in tourism, of course. But in May 2019, it truly came home to me. Years ago, 10 years ago, I was lucky enough to travel around the world to write a book on the best and responsible tourism. And one of the places I went to was a lodge called Galudo in northern Mozambique, the Kirimbas archipelago. And they were the sort of lodge that won all the awards. They did everything. They would always be there doing everything right. There's a remarkable story of what is the possible, the best of sustainable, responsible tourism. They were, you know, truly inspiring. <coughs> and I, you know, I took that photo walking down the beach in 2009. And then April the 25th, I think it was, Cyclone Kenneth washed in at 220 kilometers an hour off the Indian Ocean. And Ten years' work in five minutes became that. Galudo never reopened. They've gone on to do other things, but the community has lost that connection to responsible tourism. It's lost that support. It went in five minutes. The power of climate change induced storms is so much. And that brought it home to me because I saw how it had changed. And within a few days of that, we set up the Tourism Declares a Climate Emergency Twitter account, joined May 2019. And we published our first tweet on May the 7th, saying that tourism has huge impacts on climate change and is hugely affected by it. 
that the industry should declare a climate emergency and transform its current extractive model into one that supports resilient communities and regenerates biodiversity. RT, if you agree. Follow for more. We didn't really know where that was going to end up, where that was going to go, but we knew we had to transform. So that's where we began. And what does that transformation look like? Well, at the time that we were coming together to bring together the framework to set the scene for tourism climate action, there were wonderful stories of tourism. This hotel was being built, the Svart Hotel in Norway on the Svarts and Glacier. It's a hotel designed that solar panels on the roofs will create more energy, not only than it takes to run the hotel on a daily basis, but than it takes to construct the hotel, run it through its life cycle, and then decommission it. It's a truly energy positive hotel. It will contribute more clean energy to the grid than it will ever use. Sol Yachts designed a boat, a transformative solar powered boat for cruising around small resorts and islands. It takes people off on snorkeling and diving or connecting to different atolls. But for the majority of the day, those boats are not on the water doing anything. They're in harbor. So when they're in dock, they plug the boat into the mains of the resort and it becomes a solar panel contributing to the resort. You can reinvent, you can transform everything. Malmo transformed its influencer program, stopped paying for the flights of people to come and take Instagram and YouTube stories and said, no, no, we're going to pay if you come by train. That's how we're going to get you here. Come overland. Those are the stories we're going to support you sharing. Martins in Belgium, a small a chain of hotels, transformed the way the loyalty scheme worked. So rather than just rewarding you for spending more money, they reward you for choosing the more sustainable option. Reward you, giving you benefits that brings you back into the hotel, choosing more meals, having more evenings, all the benefits of, local, of the loyalty scheme, but specifically designed to support the carbon friendly, climate friendly, more, more environmentally sustainable options. You can do it with waste. In Helsinki, the rescue app works like a sort of delivery type thing, but it means that hotels and restaurants who know they have surplus food put it on free or at hugely reduced prices and tourists and local people can find that food. And it's an opportunity for collaboration, for discovery, for getting good quality meals and removing it from the waste chain. Addressing food waste is the third most significant intervention humanity can have to try to address the climate emergency. The destination level. Bologna has been working with the Bella Mossa, Bologna Mobilita Sustainable, which is basically an idea that if you choose the more sustainable version of traveling around Bologna, using your, you know, the card that you use to tap in and tap out, you get points that then enable you to have discounts to go to local businesses, to local restaurants, to local shops. So again, it's a circular model. The more you buy into sustainable transport around the city, sustainable transit, the more benefits you get inside the local city. Helsinki is doing something similar, rewarding people for working, rewarding local suppliers who do well, good restaurants, good shops, whatever, by then promoting them to people coming to Helsinki, saying, you commit to sorting out your supply chain, will do the job of bringing the visitors in to come and discover you. Perhaps my favorite example of them all is Sampran Riverside, 100, 200 kilometers south of Bangkok in Thailand. It's a beautiful hotel. And it has an on-site organic farm that grows fruit and vegetables, produce to be eaten at the hotel. But beyond that, they've used the farm as a training school and they've trained up this was you know, a year or so ago, they trained up, let's say, 200 plus local farmers to learn how to grow food organically on their farms in the region. Because those local farmers grow far more food than a small hotel can possibly have, they've gone around the region and they've developed a network of buyers to ensure that those farmers now can guarantee a market for their produce with other restaurants, other hotels. They've then gone to the local schools and taught the school children and the teachers how to set up organic school gardens. All of this makes a great tourism, so they encourage their guests to go to invest some money and some time into seeing what is happening and then maybe taking the example back further, back home to, you know, to wherever they've come from. 
and then every week they bring it together on the ground to the hotel for the farmer's market that brings this all together. This isn't just great food. This isn't just supporting farmers. This is addressing climate change. Organic, regenerative agriculture is another of the key interventions that we can make, that we can scale, and that tourism has such an opportunity to support and to bring to a wider audience. So how do we get there? Going back even further to 2016, to Darabin, a suburb northern Melbourne in Australia, this was the first place in the world that declared a climate emergency. They made that decision as a community. They made that decision that brought together the local councils and governance, and it's defined the way that that community has moved on. If you go to their local government websites, you will see their climate action plan, their strategies for doing this, their strategies for doing that. And it all emerged, as all things so often do, out of a few committed citizens coming together and saying, we're going to declare, we're going to make a plan, and we're going to change things. Since then, Barcelona declared a climate emergency and vowed to halve emissions by 2030. Paris declares a climate emergency. The European Parliament declares a climate emergency. Now, over 2025, sorry, over 2025, jurisdictions, communities, local governments across the world, over a billion citizens represented in places where their local or national or regional government has declared a climate emergency and said it will factor that in to making its plans. And what we see is these are the villages, the cities, the regions, the countries where we live. But in the last two or three years, what's also begun emerging is sectoral commitments. And at the same sort of time that we did not before, but as part of that tourism declares narrative, we saw other sectors doing it. We saw engineers declare a climate emergency, landscape architects declare a climate emergency, creatives in Amsterdam declaring, business declares a climate emergency. And we saw engineers, architects, designers, business. And in a third strand, Culture Declares came out of the UK and it has museums, art galleries, theatre companies, all manner of performers coming together and saying, we can't tell stories anymore unless the stories we tell are the stories that embody the climate emergency. And Heritage Declares brought together all sorts of organisations representing old buildings, fragile environments, sites that we go and said, we declare a climate emergency. And when we looked at this as we were planning how tourism could respond to the frame, the seat setting the scene, we said, well, surely the villages, the cities, the regions, the countries, these are our destinations. Surely the engineers, the architects, the designers, the business, this is who builds our hotels, designs and runs our tour operators and our travel agents and the culture and the heritage. That's where we go. This is what tourism is. We bring all this together. We are the community-based experiences, the things deeply connected and reliant upon thriving biodiversity that the private sector takes to the world. And we therefore believed from the very beginning that that's why tourism declares a climate emergency was a necessary initiative. Started with 14 founder signatories, grown to now have over 320, 324 when you last took that screen grab, all committed to aligning our plans with a need to cut global emissions in half by 2030. And what we've done since then, focusing on enabling every tourism organization to declare and deliver an appropriate climate action plan, is we've expanded and collaborated. And we've worked earlier on this year with the UNWTO, the Adventure Travel Trade Association, the University of San Francisco, and the University of Texas on this first ever global survey of climate action in tourism. We're still processing the results now. We had over about 1,300 completed sets of results coming in. And these weren't five questions. These were 50 questions. And they were detailed questions to understand what was really going on. And although we're still processing it, the one key finding that I've seen from just looking through the volume of information we've received is that of all those questions, the question that probably accounts for 50% of the words of just the volume of answers is the question when we ask people to describe the impact that climate change is having on their business. And we have data and words and stories. And it's just time and time again, 
This isn't NGOs telling the industry that it's got to change because of some external threat. These are the hoteliers, the tour operators, the DMOs talking about the change to their seasons, the concern of their guests, how it has become more expensive to operate, how things are changing. And we're bringing this together and we will have this ready for COP26. Which brings me finally to where this was leading up to, where we started, the Glasgow Declaration, a commitment to a decade of tourism climate action. Over the last six months, we've been collaborating with the United Nations World Tourism Organization, the United Nations Environment Program, the Travel Foundation, and Visit Scotland, and then brought in over 30 other organizations, including Crest and several others, to work with us to craft a short declaration, 800 words long. It's a blog in length, and hopefully it is readable. And it's there to say, we need to turn up to COP. We need to come as an industry, not an industry to be looked at and criticized, but an industry that turns up with a commitment and a commitment to having a plan and that that plan will be something we will enact. And from all the work that we've done over the last two years as tourism declares, and then through these wider collaborations, you can summarize the five pathways that we say that all plans should be. So everyone needs to work out how to measure. We need to come together and do that. Of course, we then need to de decarbonize. We can't just offset our way out of this. We need to regenerate. As Elizabeth said in her talk, it's absolutely vital that we use the opportunities that tourism has to support the regeneration of biodiversity and of unity. And how do we do these two, this, all these things? We do this in collaboration. We come together. We share our challenges. We share our flaws. We share our frustrations. And finally, we have to find and finance this. Tourism Declares has got this far with no investment. We've done this thanks to the most incredible group of volunteers, many of whom lost large amounts of their work through the COVID crisis. And they came and said, what can I do to help? And it's only thanks to their incredible commitments and the energy and the hours that they have given that we've been able to do what we have. But that can't go on. We have to find ways to finance at speed and at scale tourism's climate response. And there are additional bits. I'm not gonna go into these in any detail. We have 52 currently actions recommended for pathways spread across, which will be part of the One Planet Network's guidance to enable people to see what is on their climate action plans. There are templates being developed for climate action, all of which is there to help one another use these, learn from them, contribute back how you think they can be improved. And finally, it means that when we do turn up to COP in November next month, we will bring with us, as Samantha alluded to in her introduction to me, we will bring a blueprint for the future of tourism and climate action. And what will that blueprint contain? It will be led by the Glasgow Declaration, by a top level vision of where our industry needs to go, supported by recommended actions spread across us all. Guidelines, the best practice from around the world, what we are taking from the survey to be able to provide for the three sectors of travel of tour operators, accommodation providers, destination. And then we're doing what we can to help with measurement. Thanks to Greenview and collaborations with them, there's a net zero methodology for accommodation providers, which hasn't existed before. That'll be ready for COP. Thanks to the work of Intrepid, the only tour operator with a science-based target. And those of you who are here tomorrow will hear from Suzanne Etty, their environmental specialist, on a science-based targets methodology for tour operators. We have a working group working together now, some of the sort of front-runner destinations, developing methodologies for destinations. There are climate action plan templates, one already there, more to come. There are workshops and pilots like the one we're having right now, so we listen and learn from one another. Three certificate certifiers that have joined Tourism Declares have already shifted their criteria for their certification to include climate action planning. The reporting mechanisms and the frameworks necessary to make sure this is transparent are increasingly there. And finally, we have the community of Tourism Declares. Every single company or organization or individual that joins, people are welcome to become part of what is a safe, secure community to share your challenges partake in webinars, talk and learn together, collaborate and support. <clears throat> and it's that 
that brings me to the same that this is the blueprint for how we move forward. We have to touch it on so many different ways. And over the course of the next two days, the rest of today and tomorrow, you will have the chance, those of you who are working in the sessions tomorrow, to explore how you too can be part of enriching and improving that blueprint, take something away and contribute. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jeremy, for that message of transformation and excellent introduction to the five pathways to net zero. Examples shared in the global survey of climate action and tourism will be shared in part in the resource document we will provide following the events. And if you're interested in becoming a signatory to the Glasgow Declaration, you may visit oneplanetnetwork.org. I believe the link is being dropped in the chat now to indicate your interest and terms and conditions will be shared with you via the One Planet Network in October. Next, we are shifting gears and I'm going to share my screen. Okay, I am pleased to introduce our Climate Action Inspiration Panel, expertly moderated by Crest Board Member and Managing Director of Just a Tad LLC, Kay Danae Hines. As the owner of Just a Tad, Danae curates conversations through the lens of sustainability and service for the tourism industry and delivers resilient and sustainable solutions for hotels and events. With an extensive background in sustainable auditing and training, international standards and systems, tourism development and planning at the destination level and sustainable tourism operations, her goal is to ensure a resilient tourism industry one country at a time. Our panelists today include Janie Neumann of Visit Scotland, Paras Lumba of Global Himalayan Expedition, and Jake Keel of Grupo Punta Cana, also a Crest Board member. Danae will introduce our panelists in turn. Over to you, Danae. Thank you, Sam. Hello, everyone. Thank you guys so much for joining us today for this awesome event. Um, kudos to our amazing keynote and to um, our Tourism Declare the Climate Emergency speaker. They were both wonderful. I hope you guys have been taking great notes and are tuned in and ready to get involved in this new panel where we'll look at some practical things that our amazing panel is doing uh, to just curb climate change. So I uh, will be introducing all of our panelists in more depth as they get ready to speak. We're gonna hear from all three of them. They will each share a little bit more about their work and what they're doing. Um, and the first person who's going to speak with us is Ms. Janie. Janie Neumann is Visit Scotland's Sustainable Tourism Manager. She plays a key role in Visit Scotland's responsible tourism activity. And she focuses on the transition to a low carbon future and supports Scotland's net zero 2045 targets, which are ambitious targets to meet. With over 20 years of experience in the travel and tourism industry and working for the delivery of responsible tourism that actually benefits businesses and provides enriching quality experience for the visitors, as well as enhancing communities, it operates in and protects the natural and cultural heritage which Scotland depends on. I'm going to turn it over to Janie so that she can now go ahead and share with you the amazing things that Visit Scotland is doing. Janie, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Danae, and thank you also to Crest and Tourism Declares for inviting us to speak. Very honoured. So I will give you a very quick whirlwind tour of Visit Scotland's uh, climate action really journey on where we started. And um, just as an insight into Scottish tourism, I pulled off some figures on stats on what Scottish tourism is all about, you know, having over 17 and a half million overnight visitors that spend 5.8 million in our key markets, international markets, are the US, Germany and France, and who also contribute a disproportionate amount <laughs> and to the, the income, obviously, in tourism. And, and most visitors come to Scotland for our scenery and landscape, as well as our history and culture. Those are like the big drivers. Interesting, when I pulled this slide together, so much of it is about volume and value, and it feels almost outdated. That's not where we're at anymore, and being able to summarize tourism to a country in just those figures. Um, and interestingly, um, last March, just before COVID really hit and lockdowns across the world started, Scotland launched its Outlook 2030 tourism strategy, 
with the strap line of a responsible tourism for a sustainable future. And this isn't the responsible tourism strategy. This is the tourism strategy for the industry in Scotland. And um, for the headline objectives, it doesn't include a single volume and value figure, which is an interesting start. Obviously, a lot has happened since then. And at the moment, we're working, um, we've rejigged it to a tourism recovery plan, very much focusing on the recovery of the industry. But net zero has squarely has a part within that. And in Scotland, I'm just briefly mentioned that we're, we're really approaching it from a responsible tourism perspective, focusing on that taking action and responsibility to really not just um, minimize the doing less harm but maximizing the positive impact that tourism ha can have and has which many speakers already alluded to um, and that tourism and events can be a force for good and support this regeneration not only economically but also for host communities in the environment which is quite nicely summed up in the idea of tourism creating better places for people to live primarily, which will also make better places to visit. And uh, our four key pillars for responsible tourism are that transition uh, to low carbon economy, inclusion, supporting thriving communities, um, and protecting and enhancing uh, natural and cultural heritage. So obviously today we are very much focused on climate change. Um, but within all that, one thing I did want to mention, especially as a destination, um, it's quite different what you can do. And, and we did think about, well, where should our focus lie? What can we do? We, yes, have offices where we can change light bulbs and boilers, but really is that all we can do? So just being acknowledging our sphere and areas of influence. So we've committed to obviously internally and with our staff do as much as we can do, but we're also focused on what can we do with our destination communities, with our businesses, as well as the visitors to Scotland. So really maximizing that influence. And as you can see, usually we like to promote wonderful pictures of landscapes, but these pictures all have people in it because that will make the biggest difference in where we can really influence change and behavior change. So specifically for that transition to net zero nation. So COP has obviously been mentioned um, and we're very excited to have host a COP in Glasgow in Scotland in unbelievably in what is it four or five weeks time. Um, and it, it's really a, an amazing opportunity as an event. It will be the largest event of its kind the UK has ever hosted to take place in Scotland, but also really for the with the global minds on climate change and the spotlight on Scotland, we really want to use this to showcase what Scotland has to offer as a leading low carbon responsible tourism destination. But this is much as an opportunity for all destinations and businesses around the world to use that spotlight. Um, we also in Scotland are very lucky that um, our government has set very ambitious net zero greenhouse gas targets by 2045, which we fully support. Um, we were the first national tourism organization to join Tourism Declares a Climate Emergency um, back in November with other um, groups in Scotland. And really just to underline our commitment, but also work collaboratively with industry and with partners nationally and internationally has been a major benefit of that. Um, and we're working on a number of projects in Scotland to support industry on their net zero pathway and Scottish government has provided some funding for this and we really want to make sure that bold steps are taken to kickstart this decade of climate action. So really to, to frame this journey um, and we've looked at it as a journey and to see what, what are the kind of questions we should ask ourselves and um, the where are we now which really kind of looks at that monitoring and measuring and establishing that baseline where are we going? Visualizing that positive low carbon future for tourism and also looking at innovation and best practice here right now. How are we gonna get there? Very key, very practical aspects to consider and also acknowledging the barriers. Is it the lack of knowledge, lack of time um, or money that's stopping us? And then really getting going and providing the right kind of support. And, and this framework could be applied whether you're a business, a destination um, or a visitor in a way. And you'll see that um, the pathways that um, Jeremy mentioned earlier are all reflected in this kind of journey. So clearly, and when we were looking at what are the actions that tourism can take, 
that there are a lot of things that tourism isn't immediately in control over, but these are some of the key areas really practically looking at buildings um, and that's and transport are the two biggest ones for Scotland. That's where over 55% of our territorial carbon emissions come from. So these must be a, a key focus and clearly um, for tourism are a big thing as well, but also food and drink. Um, the sourcing of food and drink, food waste, as it was mentioned, but also encouraging more um, choices around plant-based diets, um, how land is used, um, reforestation and peatland conservation, but also acknowledging those unavoidable climate change aspects and how can we adapt to them and um, what opportunities may they provide. So there's really a wide range of activities um, that businesses can get involved in, but also destinations can consider. Um, so none of this is just done by Visit Scotland by any means. We have, we're have we lucky to have a wide range of committed partners and whether they're public bodies or private um, enterprises on the, on the ground working with us in Scotland to kind of move forward and, and move at pace and scale that's required, but also just getting started. Um, so that's just an overview from our side and um, handing back to Danae. No problem. Thank you, Janie. That was interesting and wonderful for us to understand. Thank you so much for sharing some of the enlightening things that Visit Scotland is doing. Participants, there will be an area in the Q&A for you to ask Janie some questions after we hear from the rest of our panelists and our speakers. Our next speaker who we are going to be talking with is going to be Mr. Paras. Uh, Paras is the founder of the Global Himalayan Expedition, GHE, which is a social impact tourism enterprise. He takes travelers from all over the world to see remote villages in the Himalaya and provides these villages with access to clean energy using solar grids. He'll explain a lot more of this within his presentation. Um, by background, Paras is an engineer by profession and he merges technology and his passion with an approach to creating climate mitigating solutions for mountain communities. Their work has been awarded or recognized by the uh, United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change and the World Tourism and Travel Council, as well as the UNWTO. I will hand it over to Paras to give you more about this exciting and interesting way in which he is taking uh, solving the world's climate concerns one Himalayan expedition at a time. Paras. Thank you, Rene. Uh, it's a pleasure to be uh, sharing our story of the Himalayan dream uh, at this panel today. Uh, so let me take you on a visual journey at 14,000 feet for the people who have never been to the Himalayas. So I'm, uh, I'm currently based uh, at 12,000 feet in an area called Ladakh in Leh. And uh, this is in Indian Himalayas. And the, and the photograph you see here is of the monks of a monastery, which is a 14th century old Buddhist monastery. And the reaction they had when they saw the LED light bulb for the first time in their monastery, and that too powered through Solar energy. So, uh, what we do, we are a company called Global Himalayan Expeditions, and we conduct impact expeditions uh, and we electrify remote off grid villages through solar power. In, an, in effect, we are actually combating climate change. What you see here is a five household village, uh, which was at 13,000 feet, and it took us just one day to electrify it and not through engineers but with the help of 20 travelers, which came from 13 countries around the world. What is the problem we're trying to address here? You know, as a tour company, uh, we can definitely do trekking expeditions, mountaineering expeditions, but we took another challenge. We thought, let's try and solve a global problem, the problem of energy access. As you see, more than 798 million people in this world are without access to clean energy or you can say basic infrastructure. And out of that, 16 million in the Himalayas alone. So if you look at Himalayas, there are more than 200 million people which reside in Himalayas. And out of that, 16 million do not have any basic infrastructure of energy. They still use the age-old kerosene lamps, diesel generators for the energy needs. And these communities are located in one of the most pristine locations. You, you look at this village. This is called Yurutse in Ladakh. It's a one household village. And this village is known to spot snow leopards during winters. But uh, in the night, they only have kerosene oil or a small solar lantern for their energy needs. So what's the current problem of remote mountain communities? Of course, 
climate change is one, but before that, there are no basic facilities. There is lack of livelihood, which actually leads to migration of these communities to the nearest city. And that's the kind of problem we thought, let's try and solve it with the help of tourism. I'm basically an electrical engineer. I don't have a tourism background, but 10 years ago, when we started this expedition company, the idea was to combine tourism and technology and make it as a force for development. The idea was to install clean energy solutions in these areas, develop micro entrepreneurs, create livelihood, and at the end, you know, impact these sustainable development goals. So how, what is an impact expedition and how do we do it? It's not about just parachuting into a village, uh, but there's a proper process which goes into doing an impact expedition of electrifying a village. First, you have to identify these villages because they are not on Google Maps. They are totally remotely located. Then you have to mobilize the community. You have to create awareness. What is the importance of giving solar? What is the importance of having electricity, which forms the foundation of other applications in their lives? And then you need to build partnerships. You, know, you need to invite people from all over the globe or attracting travelers to join the expedition. And then the electrification happens. So that's a kind of whole model which happens, right? This picture was taken uh, through my iPhone 4, uh, almost you can say, you see here, yeah. eight years ago. So it's not a very high resolution picture, but this is a village called Sunda Chenmo. It just took us one day to bring light to this village. And you see the before and after picture, and you can actually see the importance of light. Well, it's a, it's a high exposure picture, so it's not a light pollution which we have created, of course. And and over these 10 years, over a decade of work in the mountains, we have electrified 152 villages through solar power, and we have offset more than 35 tons of CO2. And of course, there has been direct impact on the lives we have created. And we have done it with the help of travelers coming from all over the globe, not just only India, Southeast Asia, but also from South America. People have come in, have gone back and become change makers in their own communities. You know, they've electrified their own villages in South America and Nepal. You can see the visible impact the removal of fossil fuels can bring by just one LED light bulb. You will never dance in your room when you switch on a light bulb, but this is not the case with these communities. You see them dancing, the walls of the monastery getting cleaned up when the light comes in. And of course, there is a future, as uh, Jeremy was mentioning, which they look forward to for the generations. Our expeditions are climate positive. So it's not a guilt offset you do, but you actually remove the carbon from the environment. So if you see the screen here, I take a glance around it. A, a normal traveler, his footprint would be around 55.1 tons. So this is actually the whole footprint of an expedition. But the overall offset you do or the overall removal of carbon from the environment is almost 225 tons. And this is a lifetime removal, right? And that's what we were able to do in one of the expeditions, just as an example. And we do this with every expedition when we electrify a village. And it's all about creating new locations. When you electrify a village, that means the migration stop. That means new locations are set up. That means you can disperse tourism, right? And that led us to make sure that if the tourism comes to these locations, there has to be accommodations or homestays. So we kind of worked on a new strategy called carbon neutral homestays. What are carbon neutral homestays? It's a similar concept of providing energy access to providing clean energy access to different applications from water heaters to setting up solar passive homes to creating greenhouses and solar water heaters. This is a village which is a, one, of the, one of the remotest villages next to Siachen Glacier, the world's highest battlefield. And if you can look at this picture, you'll actually get to know how a village is more sustainable in its operation and its lifestyle than a house probably in UK or India in an urban city. And this is the homestay owner who proudly says, I run a carbon neutral homestay. What a carbon neutral homestay is, we try and measure whatever the footprint in the homestay is. Either it's replacing diesel power with solar power, which has a annual carbon offset, and try and set up a solar microgrid, which is very simple. And the idea of solar is because sun is an axis, the solar power is affordable, and you can make it happen. And then you try and set up another thing because in these higher altitude regions, you need cold water, you need hot water, and uh, that is what you need for guests, right? So for travelers coming in these homestays, if you can get a hot water through solar power, is best you can get. And the homestay owner doesn't have to burn the cow dung for them. So we try and set up the solar water heaters again. You know, having good organic vegetables for your meals is what a traveler would want. He doesn't want a buffet 
What he wants is two simple local cuisine dishes, and that's what it is. So we try and support the communities by setting up green houses or poly houses. And these are actually also operatable in winter sometimes. Of course, this is a very interesting thing. It's a wooden toilet seat. You don't have to squat, but you actually have a Western comfort seat, but you make sure that the dry toilets are still in operation, right? Because they use the same uh, human waste and, and mix it with the, with, the, with the animal manure and that goes it for the agriculture purposes. So it's reuse of the human waste in a very effective manner. And of course, try and use reusable as many options, as, be it water, be it soap or whatever things you carry. So we have been trying from electrifying villages to creating carbon neutral homestays, trying to mitigate the whole thing to less than uh, 200 kgs of CO2 in a year. But it doesn't end here. You have to make sure that there are experiences and that's what led to the last thing, which was about creating nature-based solutions. So we got astronomy into this. At 14,000 feet, you have the best clear skies in the world. So we started another initiative to promote these homestays in a unique manner by promoting a community-led astrotourism initiative. And we changed the name of these homestays to astrostays, where it's a community-centric model, where you empower communities and you also create livelihood and empower the women. And that's the whole kind of model where you actually impact a huge number of SDG goals. Women, village women are trained as astronomers and they become the guide, stargazing guides for the travelers in the night. Who would know that how can a village woman who is not even 10th grade educated has got a huge information about the solar system, about the Milky Way and trying to teach an engineer or a scientist in a remote area in the Himalayas. And they use the income they generate to set up their own greenhouses or to set up more solar water heaters. And that's what a sustainable model of you know, tourism is for us. At the end, we are trying to create sustainable destinations by solar powering these remote communities, making them resilient and try and creating solutions which, which can make them long-term resilient and also very effective in their uh, you know, uh, livelihood as well as staying in the area, not migrating to cities. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Parath. That was wonderful and it was excellent to hear about all the amazing things you're doing in the Himalayas and just that sheer number about the carbon footprint and how you're offsetting them. It's just, it really does provide context for everyone. All right, so our next presenter is someone who I've had the pleasure of knowing for quite some time, uh, Mr. Jake Keel from uh, Grupo Punta Cana. Uh, he's the Vice President of Sustainability. He's an innovator, an author, and an award-winning documentary filmmaker. I love documentaries. They're my favorite type of uh, show to watch. He has confronted social and environmental challenges in the tourism industry for over 16 years, people. So this man knows what he's talking about. He gets on a webinar or on a stage or writes a book or creates a film. Uh, the foundation has pioneered numerous groundbreaking initiatives, uh, launching the first ever zero waste project in the country. Uh, and they have one of the most expansive and leading coral reef restorations um, in the entire region of the Caribbean. So Jake is no stranger to this. Um, his leadership is tremendous. Uh, he's written numerous books and he is also serves on the board of the Center for Responsible Travel, which I'm happy to serve with him. And he's co-directed, as I mentioned, and produced award-winning award -winning films and documentaries. Without further ado, I'll hand it over to Jake. Jake, please enlighten us with the amazing things you have to talk about regarding tourism in a climate crisis. Thanks so much, Janae, and thanks everyone uh, for the opportunity to share a little of our experience in the Dominican Republic uh, with Grupo Punta Cana. An honor to be here sharing stage with uh, some really amazing speakers on this panel and the previous keynote speakers. Uh, so thanks again for the opportunity. Uh, I just wanted to share a perspective of a resort operator. In this case, Grupo Punta Cana is a resort development company in the Dominican Republic and the Caribbean. Uh, our company has been around for 52 years. Uh, it started in the late 60s uh, and we're quite unique in the sense that we are more than a simple resort because of the way Punta Cana has developed over the last 50 years, uh, our resort has had to be a pioneer in a number of businesses that many hotels uh, and resort communities don't commonly get involved in. 
So we uh, own and operate uh, three hotel properties. We have numerous golf course residential communities. Uh, we own and operate an electric company uh, and a water distribution company for fresh drinking water. Uh, we also operate a water treatment facility for all of our installations. We have a private security company. Uh, we have uh, uh, our own environmental division, which I am fortunate to head up uh, in our sustainability programs. And possibly one of the most interesting things about our company is we own and operate the Punta Cana International Airport, uh, which is the largest airport in the Dominican Republic. We get uh, in normal years, uh, which we haven't seen in, in, a, in a couple of years, uh, we get over 50% of the flight traffic into the Dominican Republic, which is one of the most uh, busy tourism destinations in the Caribbean. Our airport in normal years gets uh, 4 million arriving passengers, uh, and we handle all of the operations of the airport, uh, including um, all of the land and air side operations of the airport. So that makes our company uniquely positioned uh, as a destination steward because uh, our resort, though it's been a growing resort for many years, again, we have hotel properties, residential communities, but really the massive volume of tourists that come into the Dominican Republic through Punta Cana uh, don't stay at our resort. They generally go to many of the all-inclusive hotels to the north of our property. Um, and uh, much of our success as a company is derived from the success of the airport. So I Ironically, uh, we are very dependent on the success of our region, Punta Cana, Bauro in general, rather than simply our company. Because if all of the hotels to the north of us were to fail, uh, if they were to have less occupancy, as we learned in the pandemic, that directly impacts us through the airport. And so we've seen that as a reason to make a big investment and a big commitment to sustainability, not just on our property, but really on a regional scale because we see water, we see waste, we see energy, we see the impacts of climate on our destination as a fundamental business proposition. This is something that affects our bottom line and something we have to be really concerned about into the future. So we've been pioneering in many senses of the things we've done on property uh, to combat many different environmental challenges. And of course, climate change is, is one of the foremost of those challenges. Uh, this is the rooftop of our airport. Uh, this is one of the largest solar installations in the region. Uh, our property, we have an electric generation company uh, on our normal demand in 2021, which was, which was actually fairly consistent uh, for other years because despite the pandemic, we still had uh, our hotels were operational for part of the year um, and our private residences were actually quite full during the pandemic with people escaping the cities and escaping countries that had many restrictions uh, during the pandemic. And so the resort was actually really quite active. So in a normal year, we have about 14 megawatts of production uh, on our property. And right now about 4.5 megawatts of capacity uh, is produced by renewable energy. And of course, this is something we're working on as the laws in Dominican Republic begin to make it uh, easier and more efficient to install renewable energies uh, technologies in, in uh, large scale producers and medium sized producers like ourselves. Uh, so we continue to look at ways we can expand uh, our use of renewables. So this is a very uh, climate friendly action, uh, but also a bottom line action. This is all about stability for our electric grid, uh, bringing down the cost of imported fuels and getting off a dependency of uh, traditional fossil fuels. But our tradition and our uh, culture and sustainability goes back a long time, uh, long before sustainability actually even existed as a term. As many of you know, uh, 1992, the Rio summit, summit, the Earth Summit, uh, was one of the forum where they really coined the term sustainable development and put a definition to it. And in fact, our company had created a foundation in 1988 and had declared a 1,500-acre forest reserve of freshwater lagoons and uh, uh, original forest area uh, to be a protected area that would be safeguarded by our foundation. Back when this was happening, this was simply something that made sense from a tourism perspective. It was an opportunity to share some of the local natural attractions for tourists, give them opportunity to see local forests, to uh, experience these freshwater lagoons, 
But now in the context of climate, this becomes an enormous carbon sink, becomes a very important resource for protecting water resources. And it becomes something that really distinguishes our property from many others in the Dominican Republic and the Caribbean. This is a high value piece of land. This is not simply uh, some area of our property that we decided wasn't capable of being developed and it was a swamp or a mangrove where it would be very expensive to develop it. And so we just declared it a protected area. This is actually right along the coast. These freshwater lagoons would be highly attractive for uh, real estate development or hotel development. But as a commitment to uh, our vision for sustainability, this area has been set aside and it's become a really important natural attraction in the region. And from our perspective, one of the reasons it's been so important is it's encouraged other developers to do similar types of actions. So we're seeing more hotels in the region, more developers set aside pieces of land as forest reserve, create trails and network uh, so that tourists can visit these areas, can uh, interact with them, but also creating uh, spaces for biodiversity and for some of the ecological functions that uh, forests provide. Another issue that we've been deeply involved in for many years uh, is the management of waste in our region. Uh, so much of climate action seems to be focused on energy and rightly so, uh, but in the tourism economy and in destinations like ours where we have large hotels, we have all-inclusive resorts, 4 million uh, arriving visitors a year, uh, waste is a major issue. And not simply because what we do with the waste and the impact it has on the local environment, but also from a perspective of climate. 60% uh, of the waste that we generate in the tourism industry in the Dominican Republic is organic waste. Much of that organic waste currently goes to landfills. When organic waste is landfilled, it can create uh, noxious uh, liquids that leak out, leachates that leak out of landfills and can contaminate groundwater sources, can contaminate along the ocean and the coastal areas, but also produces methane gas, which as we know, is a powerful contributor to climate. So if we're able to mitigate contributions of organic waste to these landfills, we can have a major impact on climate. Uh, we've also worked extensively since 2007 creating one of the largest recycling facilities in our region. Uh, and again, this was another impact that went far beyond just our resort, uh, because by creating a large scale recycling operation, classifying waste, separating these wastes, uh, we not only reduced the amount of waste we were sending to the landfill, we actually created a market for recyclables in Punta Cana that didn't previously exist before 2007. So if you were a single hotel property to the north of Grupo Punta Cana, you decided to recycle, you probably didn't have enough volume of material to be interesting for a recycling company to come from Santo Domingo, two hours away, cover the transportation costs of picking up those materials and bringing them back to Santo Domingo where many of the large scale recyclers are or where the exporters are that can send this material to other countries that do recycle it. So by creating a large scale model, using the volume of material we receive from the airport and from our resort and that we generate together, uh, we are able to create a significant volume that now other hotels, if they don't have the same amount of volume, can also participate in a recycling uh, in our region. So this was something that was a major contribution in the area. And again, recycling uh, and uh, waste management is a constantly evolving um, uh, industry. Uh, it's been inc incredibly complex to maintain it over the years as materials come in and out of favor, as new materials come online, as markets uh, disappear and uh, reappear. Uh, but it's something that our company has been very committed to, put a lot of effort into. And in many times, it would have probably made economic sense to just forget about recycling and send the material to the landfill. Um, and we continue to do it because we felt that there was a, a reason that this should continue, that continue to create this example, and that eventually these markets would come back around if we've seen many of them have. Ultimately, our goal is not to be recycling. Our, our goal is to reduce the amount of garbage that we produce. Our goal is to come up with new materials and work with providers that can provide, that can generate new materials that don't need to be recycled, that can be permanently upcycled. But we were really trying to create a circular economy as much as we can, given some of the limitations in our region. Another way that we've managed uh, our waste, this is our worm farm. This is an organic 
composting uh, at a large scale. This is a 40 foot container. Uh, we're able to produce close to 200 pounds of compost uh, weekly through the compost of uh, organic material by uh, red wiggler worms. Uh, we've also expanded many of our operations in composting into other areas. Uh, we've isolated certain kitchens to take advantage of the organic waste and transform it into biogas that's then used in our kitchens. So the idea is to be very strategic around our property, look at ways to minimize the amount of garbage we're sending to the landfill, encourage other operators to do the same, share that experience and continue to scale this up. I think often solid waste, we forget the impact that it has both on local environments, on the health of local people, on the local economy, but also on climate. So I think uh, as the more we get uh, engaged in the management of solid waste, I think this is an area where tourism could really take a big step forward, particularly in small destin island destinations like the Dominican Republic and other places in the Caribbean. Much of the compost that we produce, we then use uh, in local farming or in uh, in our case on golf courses, uh, in landscaping. So we're reusing treated water on our golf courses. We're using species of grass that can use salt water and brackish water and treated water uh, to, for irrigation. And we're also using different methodologies of uh, producing these golf courses so they have a minimal environmental impact and trying to lead some of these uh, pract best practices for golf course management, construction, design, uh, and sharing that across the industry. We were the first resort uh, in the Caribbean to use paspalum, a grass seed, a wall-to-wall -wall basis, which is a huge generator of uh, water savings, uh, minimizing the use of chemical fertilizers and pesticides and herbicides, uh, and also incorporating the use of organic materials like our uh, worm compost. But I think it's also incredibly important for us to think not just about climate action in terms of reducing our climate impact. Because if we look at countries like the Dominican Republic, uh, in terms of carbon emissions, the Dominican Republic is on the order of number 80 amongst countries in terms of carbon emissions worldwide. Uh, we are a relatively small producer of carbon emissions, and yet we are one of the 10 most vulnerable countries to the impacts of climate change. So when we think about climate change in island economies and in island nations, often the population is concentrated along the coast, particularly in the tourism industry, but in Dominican Republic and Santo Domingo and on the North Coast, much of the population of the country is concentrated in coastal areas. The impacts of increased storms of the intensity of the storms and the frequency of the storms is something we're already seeing. Sea level rise is something that's impacting us already. Uh, we're seeing huge amounts of erosion in beaches around the Dominican Republic and in other islands in the Caribbean. We're seeing flooding in certain islands. Uh, we're seeing uh, impact on human infrastructure and uh, natural infrastructure based on these storm events. Rising temperatures and changes in our marine environment is causing all kinds of other things uh, that we hadn't expected to happen. Uh, in the Caribbean right now, we're dealing with a significant challenge of invasive sargassum seaweed. Uh, this is a species of seaweed that is very common uh, in the Atlantic and in West Africa. But in recent years, uh, the last 10 years, the Caribbean has become uh, a second sargassum sea. And now we're getting huge influxes of this material. Much of this is, uh, is due to rising temperatures in the oceans, concentrations of nutrients in different areas and in, in coastal areas, including the Amazon and Brazil, uh, and uh, changing currents and patterns of uh, ocean temperatures. And it's really having a huge impact on our region. And the likelihood that more types of uh, changes to our environment happen to islands and into warmer tropical climates uh, is very likely. We are seeing changes with invasive species, uh, impacts on storm events, uh, invasions of things like sargassum, uh, die-offs of different species. Uh, we're seeing impacts on water quality, and this is happening all over our region and even in, in South Florida and the Southern United States. So we really need to think not just about reducing our climate footprint, which in cases like the Dominican Republic is relatively small compared to other countries, but really increasing our resiliency and our ability to adapt to the impacts of climate change. This is no longer an issue where climate change is gonna affect 
my children's children or their children's children. This is happening now. This is happening in real time. And this is happening in the 15 years, 16 years that I've been working in the Dominican Republic. I think Danae would probably say the same uh, in other places in the Caribbean. We're seeing major changes right now. So some of the strategies that we've taken to try and build resiliency, both in natural systems, but also for our resort community, uh, is really looking at the natural world and these natural ecosystems as buffers against some of the changes that we're experiencing. And so for the last 16 years, we've been working on different techniques of coral restoration. Coral restoration is essentially taking stocks of coral in the wild and growing them in captive situations uh, in nurseries, both underwater and on land. And at this time we're doing both in the Dominican Republic and then growing these corals in ideal water quality and transplanting them back on onto the reef. Now, the idea of this is simply to keep as much coral tissue in the water as possible, as great diversity as we can, at the same time reducing our impact on these marine environments, trying to reduce the impact of overfishing, uh, sedimentation, uh, invasive species, impact of tourists and tourist activities, uh, trying to control many of the factors that we can that can reduce impacts on these coral reefs. So what have we done? One of the strategies we've used is using local fishermen as the gardeners that help create these nurseries and then help us transplant this material back onto the reef. In doing so, we've targeted fishermen that traditionally uh, fish on the reef. So these are fishermen that have done an excellent job of overfishing many of the Dominican Republic's reefs, uh, employing them as coral restoration or coral gardeners uh, paying them as conservationists uh, and teaching them other types of opportunities of jobs in the tourism economy, in conservation jobs, and trying to exchange their skills and capacity in the water that they've learned fishing and applying them to new types of jobs and new types of opportunities that minimize the impact they've had on the reef, but also try and restore and regenerate some of the impacts that we've already created. So we have now worked with over 60 fishermen in our region that have been trained, that have been certified as scuba divers, that have been trained as boat captains, that work with us in strategies to combat the sargassum seaweed, uh, that help us do construction of uh, docks, installation of mooring buoys and channel markers to minimize the impact of boating traffic, and exporting this model to other regions in the Dominican Republic. So sharing how we've worked with fishermen and doing fisherman exchanges where they actually share from one fisherman to another what they've learned in Punta Cana, how they've done the work in Punta Cana, and how it could be applied to other places both in the Dominican Republic and throughout the Caribbean. So we think this is an incredibly powerful model. This is empowering local communities, creating new job opportunities. This is not charitable. We're not paying them simply to go away or to stop fishing. We're paying them to do things we need to get done. So we think this, this is a very important lesson, and this is creating resiliency both on a community scale, but also on an ecological scale. We have dozens and dozens of examples of the environmental programs we're doing and social activities that we're doing in Punta Cana. I think many of them are important lessons, things that we've learned don't work, things that we've learned that work terrifically well. Uh, we think that there's a lot of opportunities for improvement. I think one of the best ways to improve is by sharing these experiences, sharing what didn't work, sharing what didn't what did work. So I think Danae mentioned, I wrote a book about this, uh, and really it was kind of a tell all of what we've learned in Punta Cana about sustainability. Uh, hopefully you can pick it up, Waking the Sleeping Giant and find it on Amazon, sorry for the plug, but uh, really it's a lot of what we're trying to achieve with Grupo Punta Cana is sharing the things that we've done uh, and encouraging others to take this on on a destination scale. At the same time that we're working on big picture, we're working in the tourism industry in general, but we really need to drill down and figure out how operators how destinations, how hotels can improve their resiliency, uh, increase their ability to adapt to climate change and really try and take climate action that has a great impact. So thanks a lot for this opportunity. Thank you so much, Jake. You are definitely doing a ton. <laughs> I'm sure everyone in the panel, every one of the panelists and the audience will definitely agree. There's a lot going on at Grupo Punta Cana. So I'll invite all my panelists to please just turn back on your uh, videos. We have a few questions that we want to chat about as we as we move forward. Um, we're going to get into some of the questions that we have, and then we'll open it up for some audience questions a bit later.
Now, Jake, I think you explained this very well in terms of how do you talk about taking climate action because you showed us some very pertinent um, ways in which to do that, as well as perhaps you did that as well too. Um, but to the average person, you know, who doesn't understand what it is that we do every day, all day. Um, maybe Jamie, you can answer this. How do you, when we talk about climate action, how do we simplify what this means to the average person? Yeah, thanks for the question. I, I was thinking about how best to think about it. And, and in a strange way, the, the very brief phrase of target measure act came to mind that a lot of what we have to do is, is really, I guess, the target piece is make this an issue. Does it make, uh, make this part of your plan that you're going to target this as something, an action you will take? So even just identifying that, yes, I'm going to commit to taking action. And then the, the measuring piece, um, and that can be as detailed and, and as it can, or, or really broad, just even taking a look mm -hmm. at where are we at now, what are we doing right now, and then taking action. And I think that action piece um, is important, but sometimes um, really just thinking about as much as we need to do things quickly, is we also need to know where we're at. So we make sure we do the right things and we, we, we prioritize those actions that have the most impact. So um, I, I think kind of looking at trying to figure out, you know, this is an issue and everybody here has identified that and then really seeing where we are now, prioritizing what we need to do and then taking action um, around this. And, and it's such a wide range of actions you can take. Yes, as, yes as it as is. Illustrated, so it, it's amazing. It is amazing. Jake, did you have anything to add? I, I think um, we, we walk a fine line in the tourism industry, right? Because at the end of the day, people at least in the case of Punta Cana, the Dominican Republic, they're coming on vacation, I guess in Scotland as well, uh, and they want to enjoy their time. So we try and make it as turnkey as possible. The fact that they know they're coming to a place where the operator is taking care of a lot of the, the big picture things and giving guests the opportunity to either participate in activities or to contribute in their own way, uh, whether it's separate creating waste or whether it's participating in a volunteer activity or uh, in some way contributing to, 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 to different actions on the ground. But I think as destinations, we want to make it as simple as we can for them. We want them to come to us because they know that we're providing these uh, actions that they feel good about the place they're visiting. I think another uh, really important uh, message is uh, what does the guest actually want? I mean, the, often, you know, the, the towel programs in the room or the uh, turning off the lights in the room, often those are actions that really benefit uh, the hotel or the, the operator. And so the guest is not opposed to them necessarily, um, but they maybe don't have a strong feeling one way or the other. But when you ask guests about food, for example, and we, we heard the example Jeremy used, uh, that's something that directly impacts the guest experience. Uh, both their health or the food they like to eat or their cuisine. And so if you're able to create opportunities where they can uh, interact with organic or farm to table or any kind of sustainable food options, often that does have a big impact and will move the needle for many guests and make them want to come back to a place. So I think there's a mix. You want to have it be uh, big picture, simple, uh, turnkey, but at the same side, you want to kind of involve your guests. And often, you know, companies have a much bigger uh, soapbox than they realize, you know, we can yeah. message to our visitors without, you know, making them feel bad or guilty and give them tools to make decisions, whether when they go home or when they're on their stay uh, and really engage them in that way. So I think communication I is. I agree. And I think Paras has that example in everything that he does of all the expeditions that he does directly, right, Paras? I mean, you know, your guests actually are part of creating change and taking physical climate action. Um, and their stories, I'm sure you're able to share and that, but that can also make it very easy for regular consumers who aren't as you know, environmentally savvy to understand that message. What are some of the things that your guests have in terms of their feedback when they come back from your states and how they're you know, understanding the impact that they're making for climate action? I think, uh the word climate action goes for both travelers as well as for the communities, right? It's just not about, uh, you know, educating the travelers what they should be doing and how should they make sure the destination remains intact, but also for the community. I mean, we operated at areas which are very remote. 
if you utter the word climate action to a remote village they won't understand what do you mean by that but equipping them uh, giving them a very simple and affordable way of some solution which can create uh, you know long resilience for them to stay there where they are uh, it could be as simple as you know in the himalayas you get a lot of flash floods nowadays uh, so equipping them with the early warning system so that they know that they have to stay there they have to adapt to it so at least they have solutions which are very simple and demystified setting up microgrids is another example for the travelers you know they go back home a, a traveler coming from caribbean they get a lot of hurricanes in the last few years he knows uh, that if he goes back uh, to his own country uh, if the power shut down he can just have a small microgrid which he can just decouple keep it at home hurricane goes back and puts it back again so small simple affordable solutions make a long term in fact and a very simple way of educating anyone from a 2 year old to a 90 year old what climate action is we thank you thank you pana and you said something that was interesting you talk about you know you mentioned the notion of um of uh decentralized energy right and you know maybe this is kind of controversial in some areas but perhaps there are some government regulations and or cultural hindrances in a lot of the different definitions that can prohibit things like decentralized energy or climate action from taking place um the question is why do we think that is and and how would how would we change this how can we change this uh, the decentralized way of energy generation has come in effect in the last 10 years or one decade i would so i mean even the best of the countries including us you know uh, they have a power grid which is damn big and fossil fuel based uh, but everyone is coming back on having micro grids which can be still coupled to a grid uh, and still create you know a resilient power grid even if something falls off it can be modularly moved away and the rest of the area remains intact and they get the power but if you put this for a, a for a community or for a region uh, which is widespread let's take an island right so uh, that's where you don't need big bigger grids bigger power lines the lesser decentralized uh, places you have uh, the more easy it is to function and everyone can generate their own energy and consume it in terms of regulations i would say uh, for us i mean that's an example i can give is we work in the very harsh terrains and the topography is very very difficult so for a government getting power lines up those mountains in those communities is very very difficult even in the forest areas and so for it it's become very simple just to transport that power generation source into the village and make them self resilient and self sufficient in the energy i would say in terms of cultural i mean it's a funny example uh, most of the people hadn't seen electricity before in the areas we have been to uh, and when we wired their houses uh, and they were asking this is the way the oil is going to flow so they still didn't understand the concept of electricity they still thought there's going to be a an oil which is going to a bulb and it will glow so you know there are people who still are in the 19th century and then we're talking mm. about space tourism at the same time so transforming them uh, from a 19th century uh, to a 24th century uh, you know thought process is is very very empowering not only for us but also for them so i think the future of not only energy of anything else will be decentralized still connected together uh so that they make a very powerful uh, infrastructure thank you for that pras jane did you have anything to add to that question i it's really interesting because i almost dare not say because i'm probably speaking from a place where there's a lot of support from government government itself has ambitious targets there's a lot of advice and and financial support out there for businesses often it, it comes down to sometimes there's the playing with like what is it that businesses actually need is their perception of like well they must need money but is it actually more about no actually they need somebody to hold their hand through the process and and so fine tuning that and getting that right and and sometimes it's about piloting um what different businesses of different sizes need and i think that makes tourism interesting because as we all know we have micro businesses who might need a completely different approach in their support from what an international hotel chain needs so um sometimes it's just is is getting that right and getting the right kind of support to the business and customizing that but. 
I can understand that. And Jamie, since I'm, I'm since you're speaking now, I do have something that's more targeted towards you. In your presentation, you spoke about you know a lot of the goals that the businesses, the visitors, the communities, and the environment of Scotland have. Can you share with us some of maybe more of your key performance indicators that you're going to be measuring, um, and the action items that you guys are going to be taking to actually achieve net zero? Yeah, I, I think it's um, so from a business perspective, the, the thing projects we're currently working on, I mean, one with measurable items, it's like there's obviously a lot of activity going on and sometimes that, that measurability can be a challenge. But um, one thing is um, to encourage more businesses to join um, sustainable tourism certification programs because it has a number of benefits because it provides a framework for their sustainable actions, including climate action. Um, and and kind of incentivizes them for ongoing improvements. Um, it also provides a credible and visible badge that they can shout about it to the consumer. I think as somebody mentioned, this, businesses aren't always very good about telling that story. And I think we need to do that increasingly. So, um, but it's also a good thing to count. <laughs> so we have over 855 certified, green tourism certified businesses in Scotland. And it's an ability as a destination to say, well, if we see an increase in that, then that's increasing a certain number of businesses that, that have achieved that level of commitment. But we also know that we can look at how many businesses have taken advantage of some of the um, energy efficiency support available. From a business, uh, from a visitor perspective, um, we actually conduct our own visitor surveys and unfortunately that was kind of um, mixed due to COVID, but we were specifically looking at the, how visitors travel and get around and also who's starting to use energy um, EVs, um, so electric vehicles. Um, and also that that's another opportunity to encourage businesses because car touring is incredibly popular in Scotland, driving around and checking out the countryside. So there's an ambition to move that to public transport, but also can we do more of that in electric vehicles and, and where are visitors at? You know, obviously that landscape will change incredibly fast in the next five to 10 years. So um, there are a number of activities that are ongoing and increasingly it's that challenge of what can we measure and how can we show progress? But it's definitely something we're working on. Yeah, thank you so much, Jane. Measurement is very key and very important. And I have a question, both for Pass and Jake, um, because a lot of the items that you guys mentioned in your presentation tie a lot back to not only the environmental benefits, but the social and the economic impact that's, that, we're, that it has not only on your community, but also on your destination. I wanted to ask you, and, and Jake, you can start, and then Paras, I'd love to hear from you after, what mechanisms are you employing to measure and monitor your socioeconomic impact? And how does this integrate with your climate action plan um, for the communities or the businesses that you're supporting? I think it's important to kind of give the context to it. Uh, in Dominican Republic, you know, we have, have a very sun and surf uh, sort of uh, Caribbean model of tourism, but two of our biggest assets really in the Dominican Republic are the natural resources of the beach, the coral reefs, the color of the sea, you know, visiting the freshwater lagoons, all that kind of thing, uh, but also the cultural and social aspects too, because um, there are many places where, you know, simply the, the local people are less accommodating to visitors, don't necessarily want tourists. Uh, and in the Dominican Republic, we have this considerable advantage of a very open, uh, very welcome, warm uh, community of people that uh, are, have huge tradition um, in dance, in music, in uh, food, uh, in uh, music. And so there's just all, all this added value for the destination that goes far beyond just simply coming and sitting underneath the coconut tree on the beach. So we think of the people as really part of the attraction. And frankly, most of our visitors don't interact with me or with our CEO or with our you know, management team. They're interacting with our folks, whether they're working in the airport or they're working in taxis or in transport companies or check in at the hotel or hotel guests. So we really try and get as integrated as we can uh, in impacting people's lives in a positive way because we feel that, that just improves uh, the destination's ability to, to receive guests. So we invest heavily in health in the local community. We run a pediatric center for children. We run a uh, first a primary care facility, uh, both public facilities, very, very low cost, working with different international partners and the Dominican Republic, 
Dominican government to provide these services. Uh, we operate three schools, one private school, one uh, grade school, public school, and one uh, public high school uh, with jobs training for local folks. The idea being that uh, one of our greatest needs in the region is uh, people that can work in the hotel industry and solve problems, fix air conditioning, fix plumbing, uh, provide services, work as bartenders, work in service, work in tech, uh, work as English speaking uh, in guest services and reception and management eventually. Um, so we invest pretty heavily in education as well. Uh, and the measurement is really how many people do we reach, how many of these programs do we connect with, how many people are impacted by our health programs. Uh, it's so much of it goes beyond just the walls of our company, uh, just taking care of our own employees and paying them well and decent wages and uh, insurance and all the things that you expect, you know, the minimum requirements in Dominican Republic, but really trying to create a culture where people are being treated better in the industry. Like that's a key part of our business. We think it gives us continuity. It gives us longevity. Many of our employees have worked for us for many, many years because it's a good, stable situation and they get treated with respect. I agree. And I think that takes us back to the important thing that in order for all of us to meet these challenges that we're facing environmentally, it takes people. You know, at the end of the day, we are those, you know, we are the ones who are impacted, not just our earth, but it takes us to actually move forward with developing these solutions. So making us a part of that and ensuring that not only the environmental benefits are there, but the social and the economic benefits are also cared for are extremely important. Perhaps I want to ask you about, um, I want you to chime in on that. Um, just briefly, the social impact that you guys have. And then I have a few questions that we're going to get into from the audience. Oh, wonderful. So in terms of the socioeconomic impact, you know, there are two types of impacts that we measure. One is uh, a qualitative impact and a quantitative impact. Quantitative is very simple in terms of which can be measured easily in terms of the microgrids and the carbon offset and all those things. And then there is a qualitative impact what is the degree of happiness of an individual once you know he gets a greenhouse or or if the light of the tv or the access to information uh you know is he able to watch bbc or <laughs> any of the news channel at his house when the electricity comes in so when we conduct an expedition uh we the, all the expedition members uh at the end of six months post the expedition get an impact assessment report which is done by a team which has 35 parameters which we list down in terms of what is the impact that the energy which they were able to give to that village has been able to have. It, it can have diverse impact because the energy not only goes into a house, it also goes into a school, uh, which powers up the computers. It also goes into a clinic, which powers up uh, the medical instruments. It also goes into a, a commercial shop, which may help in the agriculture or the irrigational uh, pumps powering up. So it's very important that the impact measurement is done on a periodic manner. And then when it is done, uh, it also helps us understand what is the future of, uh, you know, you kind of draw a roadmap of the community as well, sitting with the community, you collaborate with them. You don't go there as a donators, but someone who has come as supporters and collaborators. And what we have seen is that the, the earlier you get the community out of from a donation wise model into a self-sustainable model by creating micro enterprises, Homestay is one example, by training the local women as astronomers or creating solar engineers, it makes the community more, you know, uh, more, uh, they, 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 they're more, they're more independent in terms of their working. So I think uh, for us, it's always two years getting into a community and then we pass on the baton to them after we have done the initial bit of the impact assessment. So that's the kind of model we follow. Thank you guys so much. That kind of gave us an overview of how we would measure certain things and what we look for there. Um, let's go to some of the audience questions. Uh, this one is for Paras. Uh, were the impacts of light pollution considered when lighting up remote mountain villages um, where precious snow leopards inhabit? What is the impact of this new lighting on the biodiversity in the area? Well, that's a very valid question. And it's not the first time I've been asked that question. Uh, so absolutely. Uh, these street lights, that is the most important, uh, you know, source of light pollution in these villages, if we install them in those villages. And these are villages which, uh, so the street light which install have a sensor based uh, street light. So it doesn't light up on its own. Only once anyone comes near it, it lights up. It is also good because that way the snow leopard stays away from the goats of the villages. They don't kill it. 
and also it does give them uh, enough light if they have to walk in the street. So we're very uh, careful with the fact that uh, whatever light we give is important, it doesn't spoil the environment because at the end of the day, these are the villages we also use for astronomy and that requires no light pollution, right? So yeah, we try to keep a balance by keeping the technology a bit more uh, sensor-based in these lines. Excellent. Thank you, Paras. Another technical question a bit. Um, this one is for Jake. Uh, approximately how much of your overall energy consumption is from renewables in percentage? In for the entire Dominican Republic, I don't I don't have the exact number. And for the tourism region, we're one of the smaller energy producers, but um, of our production in 2021, about 14 megs, and we uh, right now have a installed capacity about 4.5 megs. So um, I don't know how you do the math on that because the, the installed capacity is not exactly what you're producing from the amount of time of day that you have production and when your peaks of energy loads on. So not to get too technical technical, but roughly more than 30% uh, with plans to continue increasing this. Um, some of the challenges for us is we're relatively small uh, and we need to have installed capacity and solar obviously doesn't work all 24 hours and you can't have tourism that runs on, you know, six, eight hours or 12 hours of power. And until recently, battery uh, was, was not a viable option in the Dominican Republic from cost support is the point of view. But um, this is something that's changing rapidly. So I think as we move forward, I think renewables is going to continue to be uh, an important part of our energy mix. I agree, I agree. Uh, Jamie, I'm going to ask this one for you, um, because I know you mentioned in uh, some of your presentation and even some of your answers to the questions about green certification specifically for hospitality. How do you tackle mass tourism, larger resorts who sometimes do not maybe want to take part in climate action, um, who targets you know, visitors who are also not that aware or don't really care about the climate crisis? Um, how, would you, how do you tackle that? Those who are not willing to get involved with some of the, the green destinations or the green um, certification programs. I guess for businesses as particularly, but to some degree for visitors, it's always thinking about meet them where they're at. So, you know, they might not be the climate champions, you know, you have the wide variety of, of, of businesses and, you know, visitors on why they travel. From a business perspective, I think it's finding out a bit more about the business and there will be something that you can get them hooked with. And for a lot of businesses, especially at the moment, but in general, it can be some of the business efficiency elements to say, you know, you can save money and the money goes straight to the bottom line. You don't need another guest through the door, you know, and if that's something that gets them kind of looking at taking action and, and gets them involved, you can then continue that conversation. And so the kind of meeting them where they're at is, is often an important point and not one, you know, yes, we might want them to be further down the line, but if we can hold their hand and take them there and support them in that way. And I think for visitors, it was mentioned before, you know, we have to be honest, most visitors go on holiday and they want to, you know, enjoy the beautiful landscapes, the warm welcome, the food, the drink, you know, saving, tackling climate change will not be at the forefront of their mind. So make it easy for them and, and tell that story, but tell the story on how does doing the right thing you know, if the business does that or the destination does that, how does that translate into a quality, memorable experience that they're having right there, right then? You know, and, you know, it doesn't have to be, and, and hopefully we've moved all, all on from the, you know, it means, you know, we're sitting there without heating kind of in a compost toilet. If that's the experience you want, that's great. But, you know, Glen Eagle's one of our prime hotels in Scotland is a, a gold green tourism business. And a lot of, you know, luxury businesses um, are engaged in this. So you can really have all kinds of experiences um, and still do your bit. It doesn't have to be about ecotourism or, or um, it can also be the city center and um, five-star hotel. So I think it's, I like it's that. kind of showing how, you know, mm -hmm. you, you can get involved at any place, at any stage, just get involved. <laughs> I like that meet them where they're at notion. And um, Jake, I know you have something to say about this because we often talk about the all-inclusives and, you know, it's always a big concern um, in our region, in the Caribbean, about who's doing what and, and when and how they're going to get on board. Um, give us just a little bit of insight, um, quick, a quick response, and then I have another question for you, a follow-up for you. 
Uh, this relates to another question that's in there about other hotels and developers in the DR or another place. Exactly. Just, that's exactly the question that I'm going to follow up with. Copying our ideas. In terms of meeting them where they're at. How do you manage that as well as the other hotels and developers in the DR in terms of your example and, and how, you, how you influence others? I agree completely with Jeannie. I mean, get involved. Like, Start where you are and start doing something. Um, but one of the things with certifications that, that you know, kind of keeps me up at night, I would say, uh, is, you, you know, there are certainly big hotels or properties that will do one of these certifications. Uh, and often those certifications are just the basic requirements of the government's uh, operating licenses for environmental impact. And so it's not really doing all that much often, uh, but they get this seal and sort of like check, I right? save the environment, like move on to something else. And I feel like uh, you know, we want these certifications to be sort of like a gateway drug that bring you in and continue to encourage you to do more and more, not simply to be that one step that you take and that's that's it. So we want to be uh, careful about this, you know, not giving big uh, producers of carbon or big producers of environmental impact or social impact kind of a free pass uh, by giving them these certifications, you know, it becomes a little bit of, you know, I hate can be careful about the use of the term of greenwashing, but um, you know we want to be very careful that these certifications are not the the end, but really the beginning of a sustainability journey. I totally agree. I totally agree. And as someone who works in that space very often, um, we always tell uh, destinations and accommodations that listen, this is just part one. This is phase one, and this is only uh, uh, you know one of the elements that you will use to grow your sustainability strategy, so to speak. And these just give you a set of idealist criteria that's backed by the entire globe, depending on which one you're looking at, to kind of get you at that starting point. But there are other things to innovate and to influence others that happen throughout the, that, that you can implement that would definitely move the needle far beyond that. And when we talk about climate action um, and climate change and how we need to adapt for those things, I think all of you, our panelists, have given wonderful examples of how to do that, both at the destination or at the destination level with Jamie, at the uh, tourism accommodation level with Jake, and also at the tour operator level with Paras. So I thank all three of you for your time, for your genius, your um, ability to just be a champion in this space um, and I encourage all of the audience members to definitely get in touch with our panelists to find out more information. Uh, thank you all for your questions, for your time, uh, and make sure you get out there, arrange to be in day two for this session to actually take action. So Samantha, I'm passing it on to you. Wow. Uh, am I, yeah, I'm unmuted. Thank you, Danae, Janie, and Paras, and Jake for sharing your insights, activities, and leadership with us. There's so much food for thought here on how to get involved no matter where you are in your climate action journey. This brings us close to the end of day one of Crest World Tourism Day Forum, and we'll be sharing today's recording and an initial resource packet by Friday, so please watch your emails. More will be coming after that. We'd like to thank all of our speakers once again. This is part of a live event where everyone would be clapping madly at this point. And we'd also like to thank our sponsors once again, World Wildlife Fund, Holbrook Travel, and Legacy Vacation Resorts. Thank you to all who joined us today and participated in the lively chat. And an extra thank you to all who donated to support your participation in today's webinar. We at Crest believe in making as much information content as possible, free as possible and accessible to all. If you found today's program of value and would like to contribute to support our work on the forum and our overall mission, please visit responsibletravel.org and click donate in the top right hand corner. If you're participating in tomorrow's technical track workshop portion of the World Tourism Day Forum, please take a look at section A of your worksheets and fill it in if possible before we open. This will get the wheels turning on the conversations we're going to have during the day. You'll want to have it handy when we kick off tomorrow to take notes in section B and C. I'll close by sharing a quote from the incomparable Jane Goodall. You cannot get through a single day without having an impact on the world around you. What you do makes a difference and you have to decide what kind of difference you want to make. We hope today's event inspired you to make changes for the better as we all step up together to tackle the climate emergency. Thank you.